Well, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to Belina da Silva's uh, dissertation defense. Belina is presently the the elder student in my lab, so this will this will um, make the age distribution a little younger, age in terms of time in the lab. Thilina uh, has been been kind of a, a core of the bird part of my lab for um, six years now. Um, just to give you a little bit of a rundown of what he's done um, since since coming to KU. Uh, he has 12 total publications, seven of which um, since he came to KU, they've been, um, they've been published in journals including Bird Study, OCK, Journal of Avian Biology, Molecular Phylogenetics and Evolution, Journal of Threatened Taxa, Journal of the Bombay Natural History Society. Um, three of those publications are directly related to his dissertation. And uh, just to give you a, a fun additional one that was not related to his dissertation, um, he was the lead author in a publication that, that described a new genus of swallow. So a, a genus that had not been recognized as a, as a separate group. Um, and that was just a couple years ago. Uh, he's done presentations in the US and in Belgium, uh, American Ornithological Society, Ecology Across Borders, et cetera. Um, more importantly, he's been a, a great lab citizen and just a, a wonderful person to have uh, involved in the group. So, so Thelina, it's a real pleasure to, to see you get to this step of, of wrapping things up. So. Uh, all yours, and and um, then we'll have some questions at the end. Okay. Thank you so much, Tom. First up, let, let me switch to the presentation view. Okay. Can you see it, Tom? Awesome. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for being present here today uh, at my doctoral thesis defense. And I'm going to talk to you about um, weaver birds. And like, I'm going to talk to you about weaver birds, their evolution and ecology. And before stepping into weaver birds, I thought like, because maybe not everybody's on the same page right now. So let's, uh, let me walk you through the tree of bird life and talk to you a little bit about bird systematics. So in the world, there are close to 10,800 recognized species as of now, belonging in 2,300 genera, in 250 families, and in 40 avian orders. And like, the relationships between these uh, species, genera, and families or orders can be depicted in a phylogenetic hypothesis or a phylogeny, something, that you, as, like, something like you can see here to the right side of the screen. So, so this is one of the most illustrious and graphical phylogenies I could find online. So I thought of presenting it to you because it contains the total bird life. At least it represents the total bird life on Earth. So the tree continues. And out of these 40 orders, one order consisting of the perching birds or the passeriformes consists or comprise bulk of the species diversity. So 6,500 species out of the 10,800 species belonging belong in this single avian order. And within this order, there's this highly diverse avian group called the songbirds or the oceans. And weaver birds are part of this song, uh, songbird clade. So weaver birds fall somewhere around here in the bird phylogenetic tree. Now to talk a little bit about weaver birds, Weaver birds are small to medium sized seed and insect eating songbirds and like their plumage differs so much. Like as you can see here on to your left is a sporopipus, the smallest member of this group. And to your right, the big creature is the Euplectes. And I've, I've posted uh, a scale so that you can gauge the si their actual sizes. So weaver birds are basically like predominantly distributed in sub-Saharan Africa like over 90% of the species are concentrated in 
Sub Saharan Africa, and a few species are found in the tropical Indo Malayan and some in Indian Ocean Islands around here, which would be uh, seashells, camaros, and mascarines, and about six species in Madagascar. And view birds occupy a diversity of habitats. They're found in arid grasslands and they're even found in the tropical moist rainforests. They are also found in marshes, scrublands, and pretty much everywhere across the sub-Saharan Africa and some of the parts of the tropical indo -Malay. So as I stepped into studying viewer birds, there were like three traditional subfamilies, uh, the buffalo weavers, uh, the typical weavers, and sparrow weavers. And these subfamilies, these three subfamilies consider, consisted of 15 to 17 genera, depending on which classification you chose. But however, there were 117 species. And the first subfamily consists of three species of buffalo weavers belonging into genera. These are arid savanna species, and they're like, they have this unique feature of false penis, as you call it, or a phallide organ. Like, I, I, I've read that it's used in sexual selection, and this is unique to these creatures in the bird world. And then comes the sparrow weavers, the second subfamily, with 10 species belonging in five genera. And these are gregarious species living in the dry habitats. So this massive structure you can see here, um, okay, let me switch to the laser pointer. So this massive structure that you can see here is the communal nest of sparrow weavers. It's a truly massive structure. And finally, we come to the true weavers, or the typical weavers belonging in subfamily Plosene. This is where the bulk of the diversity of view birds are concentrated in. And these weavers are able to truly weave nests. Like the, only this subfamily, weavers belonging in this subfamily can weave nests, which is a rare feat in the bird world with a few parallels. And they have a brilliant diversity of plumage types, and also they occupy diverse habitats. And let me tell you a few interesting facts about view birds. Their nesting diversity or their nest diversity is simply amazing. I guess it's not second to any other bird group in the world. And these structures uh, range from like these huge uh, communal nests that are, built, that are built by the sociable weavers, which are like the biggest structures built by any bird species on earth. Uh, which may range up to like which may reach up to seven meters in length and weigh up to one ton. And influenced by these structures, modern architects and engineers grab some of their like some of the view bird plans into their architectural books uh, to get pretty much closer to nature. Another interesting thing about view, view birds is their high incidence of polygyny. So polygyny is a prolonged association, a prolonged breeding association between a single male and multiple females. So this is a rare phenomenon when it comes to birds, even though it's kind of prevalent in uh, mammals. So generally 2% of all bird species are polygynous, but in the view of bird clade, about 50% of the species are found to be socially polygynous. Another interesting thing is that the, small, the most species rich bird genus in Africa, Plosius belongs in the viewer bird group. It consists of like 65 species. So all these interesting thing, all these interesting things forced me to study this group. However, being an evolutionary biologist myself, I thought I need, need, needed to ask uh, a few evolutionary questions on this group. But unfortunately for me, there was no proper phylogeny, no proper phylogenetic hypothesis for the family. And the species relationships were highly disputed. Even generic relationships were not as confirmed. And genera were, like species were assigned into genera based on morphological traits and nesting behavior. So I thought in my doctoral thesis, I would address some of these issues and try to fill in some of the gaps in view bird ecology and evolution. So as you would guess, my first attempt was to come up with a phylogenetic hypothesis, an extensive one, and I dedicated my first and second chapters into this uh, thing. Then secondly, having a 
phylogenetic hypothesis in hand, I thought I needed to um, map some traits, of, uh, map some viewable traits on this phylogeny and try to answer a few evolutionary questions, some interesting evolutionary questions. And next, I, being, being a biogeography fan myself, I thought I needed to answer a few questions about historical biogeography of this group. So that would be the content of today's talk. So in the viewbird phylogenetic study, obviously my main aim was to create an extensive molecular phylogenetic hypothesis. And based on this hypothesis, I would be able to, I, I knew I would be able to do some revisions to taxonomic arrangements of viewbirds. And I, I also had this plan of doing a divergence time estimation for this family. So my phylogenetic study was carried out in two phases. So for phase one, what I did was I totally concentrated on fresh tissues that were loaned to me from uh, the US institutions that had, which were global, uh, which were US tissue collections. And also using, also incorporating uh, GenBank DNA sequences, I was able to cover 77 species out of 117 species, which would be equivalent to two thirds of the uh, diversity of field birds. Uh, I also included 14 out group taxa. So inclusion of this many out group taxa uh, was mainly because nobody knew if this group, the viewer birds were monophyletic. I wanted to test monophyly of this family. Secondly, I wanted to map viewer birds on the broader, broader phylogenetic context of passerines. Because even like what, we, what came in sister to viewer birds was not sure by the time I began working on this group. Okay, for the second phase, I wanted to reach out to the global tissue collections and to see if they had any fresh tissues for viewer birds. But unfortunately, I got to realize everything else other than the 77 species that I used in my initial phylogeny were toe pads. And some of these toe pads were collected from samples that came in from the early 1800s, the mid 1800s. And I had to use ancient DNA techniques and somehow ended up having sequenced 110 species out of 117 species in the family, which, which would be a 94% coverage. And I was also able to include 160 viewbird subspecies. Okay, give me a second. So I followed basic uh, general lab procedures. First, I did DNA extractions and quantifications, quantification before I reached out to PCR. And for, as my molecular markers, I used four mitochondrial genes and five nuclei introns, which were Sanger sequenced. And for sequence alignment and editing and uh, DNA sequence editing and chromatogram checking, I used Genius and my model select selection was done on partition. Partition find the two. So the results of phase one, gladly, uh, I recovered that the Wilbert family was monophyletic. And I found high congruence between the maximum likelihood and Bayesian procedures that I applied upon the DNA sequencers. And I was able to recover eight major Wilbert clades. So the first clade consisted of the thick-billed weaver, which was sister to the rest of the family. And secondly came up uh, the sparrow weavers and then followed by buffalo weavers. The Asian, the Asian weavers, the forties and quilias and widow birds and bishops formed one clade and malagasy weavers were found to be sister to African fossils, malimbus and anaphylactes. And when I looked at the subfamily map, uh, subfamily Plasipasserinae consisting of sparrow weavers were monophyletic, and so was uh, subfamily Bubulanithinae consisting of buffalo weavers, but uh, subfamily Plasinae consisting of the typical weavers was found to be polyphyletic, coming from two places in the phylogeny. So I recommended uh, re-establishing Amliospicinae, a new subfamily for this monotypic group. 
And some other key results would be uh, uh, the finding that Plosius, the most species rich genus, being non monophyletic. So, first up, uh, there was a huge uh, phylogenetic distance between the Asian Plosius clade and the African Plosius. And also, uh, Plosius was polyphyletic within the African clade because there were Anaplectes, Malimbus, and Notiospisa intermixed with the Plosius species. And another key result was having Malagasy weavers sister to the rest of the African weavers. So the Malimbus weavers or the Malagasy weavers were called, were named Plosius because they were expected to come within the African Plosius clade. But instead, they form a deep split. Uh, and because of this reason and because of their distinctness, uh, I recommended giving them their own separate genus. Nelicurvius. And our divergence dating analysis revealed a mid Miocene origin for the family with, the, with time to the most recent common ancestor at 11 to 15 million years ago. And the typical weavers appeared somewhat like 7.5 to 10.3 million years ago. Another key discovery in this study was that brood parasitism evolved like 8 to 11 million years ago in Africa. So previous studies estimated this, the age of brood parasitism at around 20 million years ago. So we were able to get this study published in Molecular Phylogenetics and Evolution in 2017. And with that, I step on to phase two. As, as I told you before, I was able to cover like 109 or 110 species and in this study, I was able to sample all 17 recognized genera of this family. And most importantly, 99 out of the 103 typical weavers were sampled here. This was really important for my downstream studies because this is where most of the interesting phenomena lie with, with regards to mating systems or uh, nesting diversity. And I also sampled over, over 160 subspecies of weaver birds in this study. And finally, this is the result that I got. This is how the phylogeny appeared. This was too big that I had to split it into two to have it in this, uh, have it in this uh, plate. And, and an interesting result was the placement of Brachycope and Anomala, or the bobtail weaver. So the bobtail weaver was supposed to be like at least found in the African Plosius clade. Uh, that would be around here. But my results suggested that it should come within the widow bird clade, which it looked nothing like. And another interesting result was the placement of compact weaver. The compact weaver, based on its nesting traits, was supposed to form a sister relationship with the thick bill weaver, or Amblyospisa. And based on its morphology, based on its plumage traits, most people thought it belonged in the African Plosius. That would be here. But I found that, I found out that compact weaver was sister to Quilias and Fodies. And based on this study, I conclude that there's extensive conflict going on between phylogeny and current taxonomy in weaver birds. Plumage traits that we use for the, for the current taxonomy exhibit high phylogenetic plasticity. And therefore, I recommended taxonomic rearrangements to this family. I recommended reestablishing subfamily Amblyospicinae. I also recommended uniting African Plosius, Malimbus, Anaplectes and Notiospisa in Malimbus, in genus Malimbus, and the Madagascar and the Madagascar and Plasius should be given their own genus, Nelicurvius. And I also suggested placing Brachycope with Euplectes and retaining monotypic genus Pachyphantes. And altogether, uh, I suggested name revisions for 62 species of weaver birds so that taxonomy reflects. Uh, phylogenetics in this group. 
So these results were published in uh, ARC last year. And with phylogeny in hand, I was thinking of like what other interesting things I could do with viewers. And certainly one thing that came into my mind was character evolution, especially looking at how mating systems evolve in this clade. And I was also planning on doing a biogeographic study. So for my chapter three, I was, I thought of addressing social mating systems and its evolution in this clade. And I, I want to see how associated traits such as primary nesting habitat, nesting dispersion, and primary diet was correlated with social mating systems. So when it comes to avian social mating systems, 92% of the species are more, 92 or more of the species are considered socially monogamous. However, careful observation would reveal that one or two males of an otherwise uh, of a monogamous species would be polygynous or bigamous. But anyway, these are not socially accepted things within these species, and only 2% of the species are socially openly polygynous. And because of this uh, rarity of this uh, poly of polygyny in birds, it has become a major focus in social avian mating systems research. Uh, but anyway, uh, like the previous analysis on social avian mating systems was like incomplete due to like was plagued with some of these issues. Most of these analyses were not using a proper phylogeny and even the ones that used a phylogeny used incomplete and unresolved phylogenies. And some of, the, some, some of the clades that were chosen for these studies had low incidence, incidence of polygyny, so the statistical power of these analyses were low. And to top up that with, they used crude statistical methods and were often unsuccessful. However, when it comes to viewer birds, I have a good phylogenetic hypothesis in hand, and I, I have at my disposal uh, statistical analysis that are strong enough for such analysis. Uh, therefore, I thought to step into this um, study. Generally, it's observed that there are associations between hab habitat, sociality, and diet, diet and mating systems in view birds. There's this traditional belief that monogamous, monogamous species are often found in rainforests and that they're insectivorous. And that these creatures gave rise to the polygynous, savanna dwelling ranivorous weavers. So this observation has no phylogenetic basis, but it's mostly based on the fact that majority of the birds or 92% of the birds are socially monogamous. So they assume that polygynous weavers should have monogamous weaver ancestors. So my objectives in this study were to trace the evolution of polygyny within this group and to examine the association between social mating systems, habitat, diet, and nesting dispersion. And based on these associations, I want to see evolutionary pathways uh, that led from ancestral phenotypes uh, to descended uh, derived phenotypes uh, combinations. And I also wanted to assess trade-based diversification rates within this clade. And specifically, I wanted to explore the causal hypothesis that predicted uh, that shifts in habitat uh, gave rise to shifts in uh, modifications in social mating systems in birds. So for my data, uh, for social mating systems, it was binary. I categorized it as monogamy and polygyny. And for primary nesting habitat, I had open and closed habitats. Nesting dispersion was a binary trait such as colonial and non-colonial or solitary. And primary diet, I categorized as herbivory and farnivory, uh, but mostly it's insectivory and granivory. So for my methods, I used maximum likelihood and Bayesian topologies 
uh, and prune those. I incorporated both topologies to cope, cope with any phylogenetic uncertainty. I prune the phylogenies to get a species level phylogenetic hypothesis. And ancestral reconstructions done via maximum likelihood, maximum parsimony, and stochastic character mapping. I also used discrete algorithms with MCMC as, impl as implemented in base traits uh, to explore correlated evolution of traits. And finally, for trait-based diversification, I used uh, binary state speciation and extinction methods. And also, because of the notorious nature of this uh, method, because it's known for type one errors, I also used uh, hidden state speciation and extinction analysis. So here's what my results looked like. Uh, my literature review uh, revealed that 43% of the species were socially polygynous and 46% of the video birds were socially monogamous. Uh, and also I found out that social polygyny was taxonomically diverse. It was found in six of the eight major clades that, that I recovered in my phylogeny. And also close to half, know, half of the species were herbivorous and the majority of the species occupied open habitats and a little more than half of the species were nesting colonially. So here's what uh, the result of my ancestral state reconstruction looked like. Uh, all analysis agreed upon polygyny as the ancestral mating system. Uh, and also the most recent common ancestor of all viewer birds was herbivorous and open habitat dwelling according to the ancestral state reconstructions. However, uh, the ancestral reconstructions were unable to reveal the ancestral state of nesting dispersion. I got pretty, pretty much like 50-50 uh, for coloniality and non-colonial breeding. And the joint evolution of tra traits revealed that social, social mating systems co-evolved with nesting habitat and nesting dispersion. However, primary diet did not evolve independently of social mating systems. So based on the observation of uh, birds of paradise and their fruit, frugivorous behavior, uh, frugivorous fr food habits, it was often assumed that diet had a main part to play in social mating systems evolution, but at least in view birds, there's no connection between primary diet and social mating systems. And also I found out that nesting dispersion is associated with habitat. So for my results of the order of evolution transitions, I got, so based on the base traits analysis result, I created this figure and it shows four possible combinations of social mating systems and primary nesting habitat that co-evolves. So in this, what I first wanted to know was which trait combination was the ancestral trait combination. So according to all our analysis and especially this analysis, it was polygyny in open habitats. That was the ancestral state. And the derived state would be monogamy in closed habitats. So the causal, like, the traditional hypothesis argued that monogamy in closed habitats gave rise to polygyny in open habitats. So based on the result of this analysis, I disproved that. And again, the popular causal hypothesis was that ancestral birds lived in closed habitats and their first, okay, let me have my pen back on. So, the popular hypothesis was that ancestral birds lived in closed habitats. And once they made shifts into open habitats, they found out that the resources here in open habitats were pretty much more clumped as compared with the closed forest. And because of this clumped nature of resources, they thought the males could uh, monopolize resources within these habitats. And this monopolizing of resources led to polygyny. This was the popular theory with regards to evolution of polygyny. But however, in my studies,
I show that ancestral view of birds were polygynous in open habitats and they first uh, changed their social mating system into monogamy. And because they became monogamous, only they were able to reach the closed forest. And also my results reveal that there can be uh, many shifts between social mating systems once the species occupy open habitats, but only monogamous species in open habitats can move into closed forests and that too in the form of monogamy, but there, there is no turn back. And also the results revealed that monogamous species in closed habitats give rise to polygenous species in closed habitats. And the reverse process is unlikely again. And the most interesting result of this analysis was that polygenous lineages cannot, uh, are un, are unlikely to shift habitats in the form of polygyny. So if they wanted to shift habitats, they first had to move into a monogamous lifestyle, then go all the way around this cycle and get to the close forest. Uh, and for primary habitat versus uh, nesting dispersion analysis, Again, it was revealed that colonial nesting in open habitats was the ancestral feature. And like from the, from the ancestral trait combination to the derived state combination of non-colonial uh, mating in open habitats, in closed habitats was, was achieved first by changes in behavior, uh, in behavior that is becoming non-colonial first and then reaching the closed forest. Uh, so I tested a few coevolutionary hypotheses. The first one was polygyny coevolved with open habitat, open habitat nesting while monogamy evolved, coevolved with uh, nesting in closed habitats. So this idea was not supported by my results. And the second hypothesis was polygyny coevolved with coloniality while monogamy coevolved with solitary nesting. Uh, my results favored this idea. Maybe this is because in polygynous territories, being a part of a harem provided the females and nestlings with better protection. And this offsets uh, like the costs of having to have uh, like having less food or shared male caring. Uh, for the trade dependent diversification rates analysis using BISSE, uh, binary state uh, speciation and extinction. Uh, the results revealed that polygyny, uh, polygynous lineages were diversifying a little faster than the monogamous lineages. And there was a distinct difference between the diversification rates between colonial species and non-colonial species. Uh, there was a slight uh, difference between diversification rates between uh, closed habitat species and open habitat species. And when it came to food, uh, food type or primary diet, uh, farnivorous species were diversifying a little faster as compared to the herbivorous species. However, since this analysis was plagued with type one errors, I also used a HIS analysis with, which also incorporated BISSE models and for all the traits of concern, character independent two model was favored. Uh, so character independent two model reveals that evolution of focal traits are not related to the diversification process going on in the tree. And also it revealed that there are uh, uh, heterogeneities in diversification rates along the topology and that's caused by hidden states, two hidden states of a hidden trait. And the conclusions of this study were that poly polygynous savanna dwelling granivorous ancestors gave rise to monogamous humid forest dwelling insectivorous taxa. And also that habitants at, habitat and sociality is associated with social mating systems, while diet is not. And also this study revealed that habitat shifts are not possible in polygynous lineages are, it's really unlikely. And the most important result would be shifts in social mating systems drive habitat, habitat shifts in viewer birds. 
So with this result, I stepped into addressing biogeography of field birds. And for this, I'm taking you to Sub-Saharan Africa first up. So Sub-Saharan Africa is home to close to 2,500 bird species in 525 genera, and out of these species, about 311 species are endemic to sub-Saharan Africa. Despite numerous phylogeographic studies that have been carried out on single species or small species clades, phylogenetics of species-rich clades remain largely unstudied in this region. And because of this, avian biogeographic patterns are mostly unexplored, and Historical processes that generated the current diversity is not much understood uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Since viewbirds are like predominantly Afrotropical, I thought of using viewbirds to address biogeographic uh, patterns uh, and historical biogeography of Africa. 96% of the viewbird diversity is concentrated in and around Africa and six major clades radiated within African biogeographic subregions. So I thought if I'm, if I'm to look at bio, historical biogeography of viewers, I definitely have to divide Africa into uh, biogeographic subregions. Uh, therefore, I assumed that viewer historical biogeography should reflect African habitat dynamics. And in this study, my, my aim was to infer the origin and biogeography of viewer birds and to explore patterns of colonization in uh, space and through time. And I also wanted to uh, do a divergence time calibration this time using uh, a different method. So for the study, I used a spe the species level uh, molecular phylogenetic hypothesis that I had in hand and I used a biogeog biogeographic regionalization of Sub-Saharan Africa, a scheme uh, produced by Linda. And I also used current distributional data of view birds. Uh, and for the divergence time analysis, and last time I used mitochondrial substitution rates of honey creepers, but this time I thought it's better to use uh, a secondary a uh, calibration point coming from a fossil-based analysis uh, done by Oliveros in 2019. So the calibration point was the split between uh, viewer birds and its sister clade comprising Vidwid finches and Estrildid finches. I used BioGeoBears and in BioGeoBears, I compared three models, DEC, DIVA and Bay Area like. But I avoided using the plus J parameter because of its inherent conceptual flaws and also because view birds are not overly, uh, because they're kind of like restricted in Africa. And as I said before, I used seven of the Sub-Saharan African subregions from Linda and for the remainder of the species outside of Africa, I used four other biogeographic regions and species were assigned based on current distributions. And in these reconstructions, a maximum range was assigned for the nodes to be eight. So a species, a reconstructed species can stay, can be re reconstructed in a maximum of eight biogeographic regions. And I used the maximum credibility tree, which was time calibrated and model fit was assessed using a Kaiki information criterion. Uh, the biogeographic reconstruction using all three models gave me pretty much similar results. Those were highly congruent, but the deck model was strongly favored by AIC. And it was revealed that the view birds had a Zambesian origin in the early mid Miocene, a little uh, earlier, like a little uh, like three million years before uh, compare, as compared with the previous analysis. And all initial diversification events happen in, in the Zambesian region. For example, the first split that gave rise to 
the thick-billed beaver, the second split that Ray gave rise to the sparrow weavers, um, and the split that gave rise to the buffalo weavers, and the first split within the typical weavers, and also the split that uh, divided Euplectes from 40s, Pilias, and Asian weavers, and also the point of origin for sparrow weavers. And some other milestone events of viewbird biogeography were the dispersal of viewbirds into Asia. This, this perhaps happened 9.5 to 11 million years ago. Uh, yeah. And also another key event was the initial colonization of Congo. Viewbirds were initially restricted to the Zambesian region and around eight to nine million years ago, they reached Congo, according to my analysis. Uh, and a major split bet, uh, within the Malimbus clade happened around 7.5 million years ago, which gave rise to a close forest, forest clade and to a savanna clade uh, at this time. Uh, and other observations were the restricted Zambesian, uh, that, that, that the viewers were restricted in the Zambesian region for most part of their early evolution, like 8 million years. For 8 million years, they were in the Zambesian region. And the first major habitat shift occurred into the Congo region uh, 8 to 9 million years ago. And majority of the speciation events happened uh, within the Zambesian region and the Congolian region for this clade. And expansion into other suitable uh, areas or habitats or the regions happen only after the Pliocene period. Uh, and I also tested a few hypotheses on African uh, birds. Calais in 1977 hypothesized that Central African rainforest posed a barrier for the birds uh, from going north to south and south to north. And that this idea was supported because viewbirds birds were unable to reach suitable northern habitats uh, up until like the uh, Miocene Pliocene boundary because of the Congolese forest. And another hypothesis, hypothesis was explaining uh, the East Africa high high view bird diversity in East, East Africa, uh, accounting it to place to seen climatic oscillations. But I disproved this based on my. Uh, by geographic reconstruction, because most divergence events in viewer birds uh, from this region predate the Pleistocene. And I assume that this high diversity in the East African region could be related to the Zambesian origin of the birds, because East African uh, places like Kenya belong in the Zambesian region, and also because of the localized and highly restricted diversification of view birds for most part of the evolution. So that's pretty much the meat of my uh, doctoral dissertation. And from this, I've learned these key things. So first up, external morphology and coloration are poor indicators of phylogenetic relationships, at least in viewer birds. And also I like, this study revealed that behavioral and social traits were highly plastic as compared to habitat usage in this clade. And my results revealed how a, radi a bird radiation behaves under highly biogeographic uh, constrained situations. So based on these uh, observations and based on this analysis, I wanted to add some more elements to this study in my future work. I want, to, I, want to, I want to expand this study into incorporating nesting structure and climatic niche evolution. And my idea is to formulate a proper synthesis of evolution of bio birds. And then I want to test or uh, investigate if similar patterns exist in other parallel bird clades like uh, the birds of paradise are uh, mannequins, are uh, cottingers. Uh, and I'm extremely thankful to Dr. Town Peterson, our town. Town was the one who got me here, and he had been an amazing, amazing 
mentor from the very from the very first day and up until yesterday i was really i was really nervous yesterday and he calmed my notes down and he's this amazing person he gave me all the freedom that i needed to work on basically pretty much anything that i liked and i'm ever so thankful to him and i'm also thankful to my committee uh dr rob mile had been a really good inspiration he was really helpful in uh, giving me initial ideas of choosing a bird group that I want to work on because I, I was planning on working on cuckoo doves and he's the person who changed this idea. And thanks to him, uh, today I'm working on viewer birds. And Dr. Leo Smith always, always helped me, inspired me, and he was super helpful with the phylogenetic work. He was helpful in the lab and I'm so thankful to him. Dr. Mark Mart, uh, came into my committee as I uh, approached my comprehensive exams. It was a last call thing and he uh, accepted our invitation. And he also helped me with my uh, ancient DNA techniques because he lent me his lab space for my uh, DNA work. And I'm really thankful to uh, Dr. Soberon because he's the person who introduced me to town. Because if not for him, I, I would not know town. And I'm really thankful to him. And I'm thankful to uh, Dr. Neger, because it, it was a really last minute call and she still accepted our invitation to be here as the external committee member. And I'm also thankful to Dr. Persley, who was my external committee member in the past. And I was, I was an ecologist as I came in here without any knowledge on DNA lab work or phylogenetics or anything as such. Pete Hasner was like the person, he was my initial mentor and he helped me so much learning all these techniques and his discipline in the lab was super amazing. I learned so much from him. And Matt Girard was my mentor there on. He was super helpful. He's this great teacher who's patient, who teaches really well. And maybe he's like the best teacher I've ever had in my life, at least in phylogenetics work. And Alana Alexander, she helped me so much uh, doing my lab work. And I'm also thankful to her. And I'm thankful to all my lab mates because it's been a really good family environment in the lab. Like there were tons of members coming from diverse backgrounds in our lab and I was super fascinated to meet all these people. These are like really nice people. They are my they're like my own family. Uh, okay and I also put in a picture of Robin here because he's also like family. <laughs> okay then I'm really thankful to Marlon and Claudia our neighbors. Marlon helped me so much in all my analysis and I'm really, really thankful to him for everything he has done for me. Uh, next, I want to thank uh, Chamani, Nalin and Nethni because they've been, like they're actually family, but I never felt Lawrence was some place away from Sri Lanka, away from my family, thanks to these three people. These three people are amazing. And I also want to thank the Sri Lankan community, some of my really good friends, uh, especially Nilan, who had been my friend since my undergraduate times in Sri Lanka, and also my other friends like Manjula. Manjula was uh, one of my uh, graduate teaching assistants back, back in Sri Lanka. I, I was glad to meet up with him also here in Lawrence. And here are a few more pictures of us together, the Sri Lankan community. We did drama and lots of other fun stuff. And I'm really thankful to my family. Uh, my dad was always, my dad was a super influence to me to go on a nature path because he always took me on his uh, field visits and I was able to do birding as I liked. I'm really thankful to him. And my mother, uh, who is a librarian, always influenced me to read so much and I became so knowledgeable on things thanks to her. And my brother was always my field companion in the past. 
I'm really thankful to him for all that he has done and for his companionship. And my grandmother, who is um, not feeling too well as of now, she's, she's bedridden, she's really old, and I owe her so much for everything she has done for me. And I'm ever so thankful to her for all the life lessons, for teaching me everything, everything she has done for me. And I'm also thankful to my um, in-laws. Um, they've cared so much for me and they've been super nice people to me all the way along. And finally, I want to thank Sumudu, my wife, my lovely wife, because she was the most uh, inspirational person coming along this uh, PhD path because she has sacrificed so much for me because if not for her sacrifices, I wouldn't be here doing this PhD. I'm really, really thankful to her and I look forward to more happy things and happy moments in life with her. Thank you so much.